Good evening and welcome to the Alaska Weather Show. I'm meteorologist Peter Chan coming to you from the National Weather Service through a unique partnership with Alaska Public Media. It is Saturday, August 6, 2022. And looking at the headlines here for Alaska weather, we're gonna see uh, elevated to high surf conditions along areas of the west coast, as well as the northeast Arctic coast where there is a high surf advisory in effect uh, into Sunday as surf there will uh, be about a foot or two above normal with brisk west to northwest winds. Winter storm warning continues in effect for around and above 3,000 feet in the eastern Brooks Range through Sunday morning. And then across the Panhandle, another round of rain is moving through there at this time, uh, this uh, Saturday afternoon and evening. And uh, the precipitation should diminish and become more scattered on Sunday before drier conditions arrive Monday into Tuesday. Overall though, this wet and cool pattern uh, has effectively ended a very active fire season. We're gonna see this wet and occasionally, um, cool and occasionally wet pattern continue uh, through the bulk of next week. Looking at some of the uh, FAA webcams, Anaktovic Pass shows some light rain, at least low elevations, 43 degrees, but once you get up there a bit above two, 3,000 feet, it's snowing and additional snowfall of perhaps as much as two to five inches could occur there in elevations above 3,000 feet. At Shashimaref, uh, cloudy skies, uh, 46 degrees winds there will be eventually uh, turning around to the more of the uh, northeast north and the backside of low pressure where temperature now is at 46. And then Isabel Pass has some scattered light showers with a temperature of 47 degrees and snow levels are going to slowly be falling there across the interior including the Alaska Range. It's getting down to around 3,000 feet or so. Further south and east, uh, areas of Lynn Canal have seen uh, near gale force to certainly small craft uh, force winds. Uh, Eldred Rock uh, reports breezy conditions this Saturday afternoon with a temperature of 56 degrees and you can see some white caps in that particular image. Uh, here we still have the winter storm warning in effect for the potential for some heavier snow above 3,000 feet there in the Eastern Brooks Range, including uh, Adigan and Anaktuvik passes, and then the high surf advisory for the northeastern Gulf Coast, including Kaktovik, uh, where west-northwest winds up around uh, and gusting over 30 miles an hour will cause a higher surf. Also areas of the west coast will see that higher surf, including uh, the uh, Kuskokwim and Yukon deltas, especially during the day Sunday. Fire danger has really come down. Uh, we're looking at uh, just a small pocket of uh, high fire danger there in the Yukon Flats area, but it is greatly diminished. And that is certainly good news for what has been a very active fire season. In fact, 2022 at this time ranks seventh in terms of acreage consumed, going back, looking at records going back to 1950. Satellite imagery shows another push of moisture there uh, going in through the Northeastern Gulf, Northern Panhandle. And uh, they'll see another rain, a round of rain pushing through there. Uh, uh, late this uh, Saturday afternoon and evening. It'll taper off to scattered showers on Sunday. There's one uh, piece of uh, energy that low there uh, right now approaching the northern panhandle. We still have a low sitting back toward the north side of the Kenai, northern Cook Inlet, uh, Prince William Sound. And then look to the west. We have double barrel low pressure system that's going to be working its way southeastward out of uh, Russia, eastern Russia. And as that works into the west side of the state, that's going to bring another round of breezy conditions and some additional rainfall plus colder air aloft. The colder air aloft, though, could even trigger a few isolated uh, uh, lightning strikes, rumbles of thunder. And as that system pushes inland, uh, we'll see it create areas of rain across the interior, higher elevations of the uh, Alaska Range and other interior mountain systems will see the potential for some snow, especially uh, above 3,000 feet. It'll definitely bring cooler temperatures there to the west side of the state. Uh, temperatures may not get much out of the 40s there, 50s elsewhere compared to the 60s, 70s, and even isolated 80 degree readings we had seen 
this past midweek. So on Monday, low pressure centered uh, west central areas of the state, reinforcing shot of cool air, rotating on up through the southwest interior. And we could even see an isolated uh, thunderstorm uh, pop up there, especially uh, along the eastern parts of the interior, along the Elkan border. Low te I should say low temperatures this Sunday morning. The panhandle generally in the 50s, relatively mild. We're looking at 40s to near 50 degrees, upper 40s to near 50 degrees across much of uh, south central. And temperatures uh, Sunday warmest, uh, southern panhandle lower 60s, but elsewhere 50s with the cloud cover and some showers there including the Anchorage Bowl and uh, uh, up through the Matsu Valley. Monday morning lows are going to generally be across the region, upper 40s to lower 50s. And high temperatures on Monday might just be a little better there with less in the way of showers. Uh, could see uh, some mid-upper 60s southern panhandle and getting back into the 60s around Cook Inlet. For the north, uh, we're looking for lows generally uh, in the 40s along the Yukon River, lower mid 40s back through the Seward Peninsula. 30s and areas along the spine of the Brooks Range getting down near and a bit below freezing. Afternoon highs still could squeak out some 60s there. The Yukon Flats, Fort Yukon down toward Eagle and Northway. Otherwise, 50s fairly common, 40s up there uh, along uh, the Arctic Coast and Seward Peninsula. And then Monday morning lows generally in the lower mid 40s across much of the region, though some mid-upper 30s there along the Arctic coast and perhaps in the far west along the west side of the Seward Peninsula. Monday afternoon, we are looking for temperatures similarly uh, near 50 and uh, perhaps a few 60 degree, lower 60 degree readings uh, east central areas along the Alcan border, but otherwise 40 is very popular along the north slope and in through west side of the state. Low Sunday morning will generally be uh, mid 40s or so across much of the southwest, including the Kuskokwim and Yukon River basins. Sunday afternoon, definitely only lower 50s if that. Coastal areas may be slipping into the upper 40s for cooler conditions. And Monday morning's lows will generally be in the 40s across much of the region, though stopping around 50, say at uh, King Salmon as you go on down. Uh, at least the Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak holding up there at about 52. And then Monday afternoon, readings back there through the southwest interior, mid 40s to near 50 degrees. Some lower 50s as you get out along uh, the Aleutian chain. And here's a look at the 6 to 10 day temperature outlook, August 12th through the 16th, centered on the middle of the month. Cooler across uh, the central and northeast, including the Panhandle, near normal, southwest Alaska Peninsula, and the uh, uh, Aleutian chain and temperatures should moderate past mid-month, maybe getting a little above normal back up across the southern portion of the mainland, still a bit below normal across the north slope and Arctic coast. Rainfall uh, as we go uh, then six to ten day outlook near normal across most of the states, slightly below normal through the southwest. And looking here at mid-month though, we could see a bump up again of precipitation averaging a bit above normal across the southern half of the mainland, especially south central and the southwest as we get moisture coming in up from the North Pacific and Bering with southwest flow aloft. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Let's take a look now at your aviation weather if you have a flight planned Sunday or on Monday. The primary weather feature that's going to be affecting the state is an area of low pressure, not just at the surface, but aloft, especially mid-levels of the atmosphere. It's a colder pool of air aloft that's going to be dropping uh, northwest to southeast into the west side of the state from the uh, Chukchi Sea and eastern Russia. As we start out Sunday morning, still some lingering IFR, especially the inner channels, inner coastal mountains of the Panhandle on up toward uh, the McCarthy area and then further north and west we continue to see some lingering IFR conditions along the uh, spine of the Brooks Range as winter weather conditions beginning to wind down those snows that are heavier snowfall that we expect uh, through the day uh, today this Saturday into uh, Sunday night before ta uh, Saturday night before tapering off back to the west we have widespread IFR conditions out over the bearing uh, Sunday afternoon uh, conditions uh, there through the panhandle more MVFR uh, IFR, though, will hold there, especially along the southwest uh, coast, up into Bristol Bay and back through uh, the eastern central Aleutians. Monday morning, uh, we'll see pockets of IFR conditions spreading further inland and across the interior and along areas of the Alaska Range extending into south central, southeast portions of the state, and still along the inner channels and inner coastal mountains there, butting up against British Columbia. Monday afternoon could be an isolated thunderstorm pop up on the east side of the Brooks Range. Otherwise, uh, generally MVFR conditions are anticipated across much of the mainland with an area of uh, some 
IFR conditions possible there uh, in the southeast, uh, just along the, the northern Gulf Coast. Also IFR hugging along and just off the uh, Arctic coastline and then extending back down uh, out over the lower bearing into the central Aleutians. Anatovic Pass should generally see IFR conditions improve to MVFR on Sunday. That'll also be the case at Attigan Pass, IFR conditions early, uh, improving to MVFR as the uh, snow that is anticipated to be falling there across the uh, Eastern Brooks Range will begin to let up there early Sunday morning. Lake Clark and Merrill, generally MVFR conditions becoming IFR as the go day goes on as that next system uh, drops in from the northwest. It's gonna pull some moisture up from the southwest. Uh, thereby lowering ceilings and uh, allowing more precipitation to overspread the region. Rainy Pass should generally see MVFR conditions, as will Windy Pass and further east through Isabel Pass along the eastern Alaska range, MVFR conditions. Mentasta should generally have uh, MVFR conditions, though uh, maybe a little IFR at the south entrance southward uh, early Sunday before giving way to MVFR. Tanita Pass, generally MVFR conditions are expected and Portage Pass should also generally hold on to MVFR conditions, especially there along the east entrance and extending out into Prince William Sound, though areas uh, around and west of the west entrance may see a period there of VFR. And then finally, Chilkoot and White will see IFR conditions Sunday morning give way briefly to some MVFR conditions, but IFR conditions will likely return to uh, the northern panhandle uh, as we go through Sunday night into Monday morning. Freezing levels have come down uh, along the northwest and Arctic coast to near 2,000 feet aloft. Uh, the central interior down around 4,000 feet there through the central Yukon Valley and down to 6,000 feet uh, south central areas including Cook Inlet and Prince William Sound. We still see freezing levels near uh, 12,000 feet, the south end of the Panhandle, as well as out over the eastern Aleutians. And the greatest threat of icing on Sunday, moderate icing will be possible uh, on the west side of the state as that cold core mid-level low begins to head southeastward in the west side of the state, uh, above 4,000 feet around the Bering Strait uh, outside there at Kotzebue Sound. Uh, as we get down toward the southwest interior above 6,000 feet, and uh, generally the eastern uh, interior into northwest Canada uh, above 7,000 feet. Jet stream level winds are strongest, uh, 30,000 feet, uh, 110 knot north northeasterly jet core coming across eastern Russia into the central bearing before turning westerly into the southwest to 95 knots. At 700 millibars, 9,000 uh, feet aloft, low pressure circulation showing up near the Bering Strait with 60 knot. Uh, westerly winds coming in across the southwest and the uh, lower west arm of the Alaska range. And then finally, uh, down to 3,000 feet, we have a low pressure circulation near Norton Sound with a broad area of 35 to 45 knot winds across much of the southwest uh, there. And that will translate to a threat of some considerable moderate turbulence across much of the west central interior and all of the southwest, which includes the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island from the surface to 4,000 feet, and then a little pocket of surface to 5,000 feet there, the southern end of the panhandle. So if you are able to get out, certainly have a safe flight. When you think of a national park, you probably envision wide open natural spaces undisturbed by human activity. There are indeed such places, but even in some of the most remote areas of a place like Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska, the mark of man is present. Marine debris is a menace to the farthest reaches of our globe, and even designated national park lands are not immune. In the summer of 2009, the Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance, a grassroots conservation organization based in Seward, Alaska, decided to do something about the marine debris fouling the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park. Marine Debris Coordinator Tim Johnson had first-hand experience with the issue. The summer before, uh, my wife and I, Michelle, had done a paddle from Seward, a uh, sea kayak paddle from Seward to Homer. Really, our eyes were open to some areas that we didn't realize there was so much accumulation. It was very deceiving up front. You couldn't really get a feel for the, the extent and impact of it. You've got this, this, this nice high tide line that's quite pristine, and you really don't get a picture for the, the impact, the amount of uh, debris 
in that area until you get behind those storm berms. You get back into the lagoons and the, the vegetation around those lagoons. And then you see the, the absolute extent back into that veg and how intertwined and enmeshed um, these decades of trash deposition. So we were just appalled by that and said we, we got to get something together on a larger scale. The Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance is a local um, nonprofit community organization and they have been instrumental in helping um, the Park Service obtain funding to, to get uh, a boats, larger boats to help move the debris and they get volunteer labor and organize the work trips and so it's really a partnership between the Park Service and the community to help get out and really get a project done that in and of itself any one group couldn't do it on their own. Most of that trash was baggable, however, there were large items, huge, you know, piles of hauser line, uh, for example, that, you know, we just had to hoist up onto the boat. The volunteers didn't just bag, haul, and hoist the garbage, but also carefully recorded what types of debris were collected. In many ways, the debris itself is a resource. Um, archaeologists use middens, the trash heaps, um, as a way of analyzing past cultures, and in one sense, Marine debris is a form of a midden. It's a trash heap that left for the future would be something that people could use to analyze our cu culture. It may not say the best things about our culture or everything that we want, but we need to be able to document what we've done um, so that we can preserve that legacy, um, make sure that we as a society don't forget what we've, what we've been doing. We had two larger categories of, of, of marine debris that we picked up. Um, commercial fishing um, means like, um, say, uh, gill nets, um, large hauser lines, anything that, that would be associated with more of a commercial fishing scale. And then the second category was, was more recreational fishing and household, you know, which would be you know, general plastics, um, you know, things like that. Um, so we had about a 75% of the commercial fishing uh, marine debris element and about 25% of the recreational and household further out the bay, and we had the exact opposite the closer we got to Seward uh, within the bay. It was about 25% commercial uh, fishing versus 75% recreational fishing and, and household. The trash is not just unsightly for park visitors, but also poses threats to wildlife and marine habitat. Really one of the larger issues now that you go to this plastic that has, uh, can really get into the food web and affect the food web differently than something like glass. These substances, for instance, all these polystyrene blocks that are breaking down into all these little crumbly bits are, are further breaking down on a microscopic level and uh, how much of an impact that has, you know, in this ecosystem is yet to be determined, but I think it's got pretty high potential. You know, well known that sea turtles will eat plastic bags floating in the water. They look like jellyfish to a sea turtle, and um, obviously a plastic bag doesn't uh, go well in the digestive system of a turtle. Um, albatross will see small pieces of plastic floating on the surface and think they're small fish and other food sources, and 
eat that in their stomachs, especially in some of the um, northwestern Hawaiian islands. It, they, they'll find dead albatross that have starved to death with a full stomach and it's full of pl pieces of plastic. We're affecting our local areas this way, uh, but we need to be thinking about it from more of a state and, and, and global international uh, scale. And, and most importantly, to, to try and focus on prevention of it coming in the first place. Because we're just going to see this continuing you know, to build up on our beaches unless we're able to, to get a little bit more of an approach on, on prevention on the front end. Marine debris is really a global problem um, you know, in all the oceans, and you know, there are many different sources. Global shipping is one. Fishing debris from commercial fishing, um, recreational boating activity, activity on land, stuff blowing off land, washing down streams, people just throwing stuff on the shore. Though the problem can seem overwhelming, Johnson remains upbeat about making a positive difference. No, you got to you got to start local. You got to you know take control of what you can do, and 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 make something with that, and and try and you know move on from there. Overall, more than nine tons of debris was removed from the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park and transported back to Seward to be deposited in a landfill. People gave a lot to the project in order to make it happen. That was um, awesome. One of the most amazing experiences I've ever um, had. Be able to put that that large of a group of volunteers together, dedicated um, volunteers to put that much effort and, and give that much time and pull all these the different agencies together to see it all happen um, was, yeah, it was, it was incredible. It was really incredible. Yeah, very fulfilling um, experience. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back, and we've come to our final segment of the show. Before we get into the marine forecast, looking at the sea ice edge, there still is some ice there along the Arctic coast. Uh, it's just going to be slow going when it comes to melting. We also have some ice lingering along the Russian coast. But otherwise, uh, as we go through the latter half of the summer, it'll just be a slow process as that ice uh, continues to slowly melt. Uh, winds. Well, uh, they will be uh, picking up in areas, especially down there through the lower Chukchi Sea while letting up. Right now, we do have some rather gusty west-northwest winds along the eastern Arctic coast and also areas of the northwest that will be coming down on Sunday. Uh, but then we expect westerly winds, especially along the southwest coast, to be picking up with the next low pressure that comes out of eastern Russia. Across the panhandle, winds for the inner channels will come down as well, generally in the 10 to 20 knot range. Uh, south, southwesterly there, Petersburg on up through Juneau and Lynn Canal. Waves running three, four feet there. Northwest winds, 10 knots, two foot waves around Ketchikan, Matlakotla. The outer coast, uh, the Gulf, uh, west winds, 15 knots, waves running right around seven feet from Craig to uh, Gustavus. More south, southwesterly, Yakutat westward with seven foot waves. On Monday, look for south winds uh, at 10 to as high as 20 knots through Lynn Canal with waves of two to as high as four feet. Northwest winds 15 knots and waves three feet there, uh, Ketchikan, Matlakotla. And winds along the uh, Gulf Coast will be south, southwest, Yakutat westward, five foot waves. West to northwest, especially south of Gustavus, 20 knots from Sitka down to Craig with waves of six feet. For Sunday across the northwestern Gulf and Cook Inlet, Lower Cook Inlet, the entrance and off the Kenai, west winds 25 to 30 knots, waves seven to eight feet. Mixed bag, vari uh, variable winds, 50 knots, Prince William Sound, and waves there a couple of feet. North end of uh, Cook Inlet could see variable winds uh, because of low pressure in that vicinity moving away. Uh, could pick up as high as times of 30 knots, but otherwise generally less than that. And for Monday, we expect winds across a broad area of the region to be out of the south, southwest. 15 to 25 knots, waves a few feet in uh, Prince William Sound. Uh, three to five feet across Cook Inlet and five, six feet off of the Kenai. And then across uh, the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, winds will generally be uh, southwesterly, 20 to 25 knots on the North Pacific Gulf side waves, five to seven feet there. 
but upwards of 30 knots, Shelikov straight and then back through the Bering side, including Bristol Bay, where waves could run as high as seven to uh, as 10 feet. And then for Monday, winds come down a bit. Look for southwest to west winds, 20 to 25 knots. Waves five to seven feet on the North Pacific side and six to seven feet on the Bering side. For Sunday across the Aleutian chain, Variable winds on the North uh, Pacific side at 10 knots, waves three, four feet. Westerly, 15 to 20 knots on the Bering side with waves of four to six feet, becoming more south, southeasterly, 20 to 25 knots west of ADAC. And then on Monday, overall, winds are gonna try and turn back around with an easterly component. Uh, they'll be around 15 to 20 knots. The central Aleutians picking up to 20 to 25 knots from the east, west of ADAC, increasing five to nine feet. A little bit more of a mixed bag of winds around Dutch Harbor in the far east end of the Aleutians with waves three feet there on the south side and six feet on the Bering side. Across uh, the southwest, we see those 30, 35 knot southwesterly winds coming up into Kuskokwim Bay and Bristol Bay. Therefore, there could be some elevated surf waves nine to 11 feet. Westerly winds north of Nunavik Island still near 30 knots falling off to uh, west-southwest winds in the Norton Sound with waves uh, there running five to six feet. On Monday, winds do come down. Uh, look for northwesterly winds, 15 to 20 knots, uh, Nunavik Island down toward St. Paul, St. George, waves five to seven feet. And we're looking at westerly winds, 25 knots, uh, coming on into Norton Sound with waves running about five feet. Across the Arctic coast, uh, winds will be uh, southwest to west, 15 to 20 knots, waves two to four feet. Uh, winds across the lower Chukchi Sea will have a southerly component before turning northwesterly, north northwesterly to 20 knots as low pressure moves inland across the west central interior, waves three to four feet. And on Monday, we expect easterly winds along the Arctic coast, 15 knots, waves three feet. And then the lower Chukchi Sea winds will be out of the north, uh, increasing to 20 to 30 knots, passing through the Bering Strait before turning westerly on the north side of Nunavik Island and on into Norton Sound uh, as winds will pick up to 25 knots with waves as high as eight feet. So that wraps up the show for this Saturday evening. Thank you for watching and be sure to join me again tomorrow night. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.